Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to start diving into this book, Lost Cities, Ancient Tombs, 100 Discoveries That Changed the World. This book was donated by Life of Pi. Thank you very kindly. If you would like to donate a book to my channel, I have my Amazon wish list in the description. No pressure or anything, I'll purchase those books eventually, but if you want to see it on my channel sooner than later, you can donate them, just like this book, which I was so excited to get, because this is a National Geographic book, and they put out a lot of previews, like the Lost Cities magazine that you guys really enjoyed, and I enjoyed too, and the last National Geographic issue, which had segments from this book in it guys really like that too. So, let's just dive right into chapter one. But first, I'm really weird about dust covers. I hate dust covers. I can never ever read books with the dust cover on, so let me remove it real quick and carefully. There we go. I don't know what it is about them. I just, they annoy me. Let's start with chapter one. Oops. Spoilers. More spoilers. Okay. Chapter one takes place 3.6 million years ago to 50,000 BCE, and it's all about the bones of our ancestors. And so interestingly, I just covered Indonesia on my channel. This cave is on the island of Flores, and we're going to discover why this cave is so interesting. So let's start with chapter one, the first steps of humankind 3.66 million years ago in Laetoli, Tanzania. This is Australopithecus afarensis. Some 70 footprints preserved in volcanic ash for millions of years proved that our earliest ancestors walked much like we do today. It happened some 3.66 million years ago at the onset of a rainy season on an East African savanna pocked with wind-sculpted acacia trees. A volcano to the east, now called Sadaman, heaved restlessly, spewing ash over the flat expanse. Over a period of days, the churning volcano blanketed the plain with thin layers of ash, which were interspersed with the light rains. At Laetoli, in what is now Tanzania, a group of bipedal, ape-like creatures continued on their way unfazed, leaving their tracks behind in the damp and dash. The conditions were perfect for preservation. Without the gentle rains, the bone-dry footprints would have disappeared in a gust of wind, while, the, while a harder shower would have obliterated them. As the dampened ash hardened, more debris settled on top, protecting the footprints in exquisite detail. Through the millennia, sediments buried them deeper, then faulting and erosion brought them near the surface again. Finally, in the late 1970s, a combination of luck and perseverance would lead to their discovery by a team led by Mary Leakey. They remain by far the oldest footprints of hominins, members of the human family, ever uncovered. At a time when few women worked in paleoanthropology, Mary Leakey was in a league of her own. She first explored Tanzania's Laetoli beds in 1935 with her husband, Louis Leakey, but her passion for the past started long before that. The daughter of a painter, Mary had spent her childhood traveling through southern France with her father. The area is full of prehistoric caves, she said. Both my parents were interested in them, and I scraped around the caves while father painted. After that, I don't think I ever really wanted to do anything else. Mary prepared for her future life with courses in geology and prehistory at University College London. Move this down a bit. Her career took off at the age of 17 with a post as an illustrator at a dig in Devon, England. She had a gift for creating incredibly detailed sketches of archaeological artifacts and the process of their extraction. That talent brought her to the attention of her future husband, who requested that she illustrate one of his books. Beginning in the early 1930s, the pair focused their work in Africa, 
at Tanzania's Olubai Gorge, some 20 miles northeast of Laetoli. Even though most Western experts at the time thought humans evolved first in Asia, they kept returning to Olduvai Gorge over the years, and in the late 1950s and 60s, they made momentous finds that confirmed their belief that East Africa was the cradle of humankind. But Mary had never forgotten Laetoli. I could not help feeling, she said, that somehow the mystique of Laetoli had eluded us. Then, in 1974, an associate found a hominin tooth at Laetoli that proved to be at least 2.4 million years old, kicking off a resurgence of interest in the site. Though her husband had passed away, Mary Leakey was drawn back to where they had begun their African adventures. In 1975, with support from the National Geographic Society, she mounted an extensive survey of the Laetoli beds. The team was into their second field season when fortune arrived, courtesy of an impromptu elephant dung fight. Dr. Andrew Hill of the National Museums of Kenya and several colleagues were larking about on the beds, Mary later wrote, pelting each other with dry elephant dung. As Andrew ducked low to avoid one such missile, he noticed a series of punctures in the volcanic tuff. They turned out to be animal prints, perfectly preserved in the ground beneath them. Slowly, painstakingly, the surveyors uncovered the tracks, hoping to find ancient hominin footprints among them. After two years of searching, the effort paid off. In 1978, Paul Abel, who had joined Leakey's team that year, came upon the first hominin imprint. It turned out to be part of an 88-foot-long, 70-footprint trail left behind by three individuals, two walking side by side, and a third following behind. Based on fossil teeth and jaws Leakey and her team also found at Laetoli, the tracks had been left by members of the earliest known human ancestor, Australopithecus afarensis, best known from the famous Lucy skeleton found in Ethiopia a few years earlier, and dated to around 3.1 million years ago. The footprints pushed back the evolution of upright walking another half a million years. The implications were astounding. The prints suggest that even at the beginning of our evolution, our ancestors' feet were similar to ours in form and function. Besides being clearly evolved for bipedalism, with big toes in line with the rest of the foot instead of splayed out for an ape-like grip when climbing, they show that early humans walked with a heel strike motion, with the heel of the foot hitting first and the toes pushing off last. This unique ability freed the hands for myriad possibilities, Mary wrote later. Carrying, tool-making, intricate manipulation from the single development, in fact, stems all modern technology. The compact stride of the prints suggest that Aofarensis individuals had much shorter legs than modern humans, but the record of their passage still felt eerily similar familiar. While studying one set presumed to be a female's, Mary mused. At one point, she stops, pauses, turns to the left to glance at some possible threat or irregularity, and then continues to the north. This motion, so intensely human, transcends time. In 2015, 14 more footprints were added to the collection by two Tanzanian archaeologists who were there to evaluate whether the site could safely hold a museum. The tracks of two individuals are in the same ash layer and orientation as the ones found in 1978, intimating that they may have been made by members of the same group traveling across the landscape. One set of tracks showing larger strides was likely made by an individual over 5.5 feet tall, among the largest known members of the species. The researchers see this as a clue to the social structure of Aofarensis. If males and females of the species had substantially different body sizes, a trait called sexual dimorphism, the footprints can be read as one adult male, the large individual, along with two or three adult females and as many juveniles. This social organization would resemble that of modern-day gorillas, where one male shares multiple females. Some other researchers aren't convinced pointing out that it's impossible to know the age of the individuals based on their footprints, 
or whether the new tracks belong to members of the same group as the original ones. Future scientists will no doubt have more to say and discover. Chapter 2, Walking with Lucy. There we go. This is 3.2 million years ago in Hadar, Ethiopia. Some more Australopithecus afarensis. An iconic skeleton from the desert transforms the understanding of our origins. It was a blistering morning in November 1974, and paleoanthropologist Donald C. Johansson and his colleague Tom Gray had all but given up looking for fossils in the badlands of Hadar in Ethiopia's Afar Triangle. Johansson had been to Hadar before, in 1972, on a reconnaissance trip, and again in 1973, when he had discovered the knee joint of an ancient hominin, a member of the human family. With the temperature at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, they were heading back to their Land Rover when Johansson noticed something protruding out of the ground halfway up the slope, a fragment of a little arm bone. Johansson knew right away it was hominin. Then they noticed other pieces of bone scattered about. A piece of a skull, a bit of thigh bone, some vertebrae, ribs, part of a pelvis. Incredibly, they had come upon the skeleton of a single individual over three million years old. Tom let out a yell, Johansson later recalled, and then I heard myself yelling too, and we were hugging each other and dancing up and down in the heat. That night, they celebrated back at camp, a Beatles cassette tape playing on repeat. Johansson already suspected their specimen was female, so when Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds came on, the nickname seemed to suit her. There she is. She would also get an Ethiopian name, Dignesh, the Amharic term for you are marvelous. And marvelous she was, both the oldest known hominin ever found, and with 40% of her skeleton preserved, among the most complete. She prompted as many questions as she had answers. What species did she belong to? Could she be our direct ancestor? What was her habitat like? How did she live, and how did she die? Johansson could confirm from the form of the pelvis that she was female. She was small in stature, he wrote. The short leg bone suggested a height of three and a half to four feet. Her erupted wisdom teeth and the growth state of certain bones indicated she was a young adult when she died. Lucy's most telling feature was that she clearly walked on two legs. Though her brain wasn't much larger than a chimp's, her pelvis, femur, foot, and knee bones were all evolved, to allow her to move upright with minimal muscle fatigue. Her pelvis, for instance, was flared out to carry muscles for stability, and the angle of her femur brought her legs under her body, clear signs of bipedal ability. The discovery of Lucy thus strengthened the idea that upright walking was the earliest selective trait driving human evolution, appearing at least a million years before there was evidence for a bigger brain or tool-making. In addition to her small brain, Lucy had a mix of other primitive features. Her long dangling arms, curved finger bones, and shoulder joints all indicated that in spite of its upright manner of walking, her species still climbed trees, probably in search of food or safety. If Lucy saw an attractive fruiting tree, she would have climbed it, wrote Johansson. Most of the time, however, she walked on two legs like us. Lucy was not the only fossil Johansson would find. The following year, his team uncovered something even more amazing, a trove of almost 200 hominin fossils from another Hadar site, including jaws, teeth, leg bones, foot and hand bones, cranial fragments, and even a piece of an infant skull. Together with Lucy and some jaws from the site of Laetoli in Tanzania, these additional specimens allowed Johansson and his colleague Tim White to name a new species they called Australopithecus afarensis, southern ape from afar. It wasn't the first Australopithecus found, that was Australopithecus africanus, discovered in South Africa in 1924, and other Australopithecines with huge jaws and teeth were later found in both East and South Africa. But Johansson and White argued that Aeopharensis alone was the direct ancestor of her own genus Homo. On their family tree, the other Australopiths occupied a side branch in evolution that went extinct some 1.5 million years ago. 
Later discovery suggested that A. R. Farensis was also the longest-lived hominin species ever, surviving more than 900,000 years, some three times as long as Homo sapiens have been on the planet so far. For 20 years, Lucy remained our oldest known human ancestor, but later finds, notably Artipithecus ramidus, another species found in the Afar, pushed the human lineages split from the ones leading to chimps back at least 4.4 million years ago. Analyses of the evolution of genes suggest the split may be even more ancient. Yet Lucy remains the most iconic hominin skeleton, both for her profound antiquity and her relative completeness. As I walked to my tent, Johansson wrote at the end of one Hadar field season, it comforted me to realize that Hadar would wait for us, the forces of nature slowly uncovering more fossils from the layers of time, and there would always be more to learn in the quest for understanding of mankind's origins. Lucy changed our understanding of human history, and she and her homeland may yet have more secrets to share. Chapter 3, The Toolmaker of Olduvai Gorge this is 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago at Olduvai Gorge, Tanzania, Homo habilis. The leaky family's finds in Tanzania helped convince the world that East Africa was the cradle of our ancestors. Passionate and strong-willed, focused and devoted, Lewis and Mary Leakey and their son Richard came to be known as the first family of paleoanthropology in the mid-20th century. The Leakeys played a pivotal role in convincing the scientific community that Africa held the key to understanding our origins, but it was a long road, and one paved with potholes. Born in colonial Kenya to Anglican missionaries, Lewis grew up among the local Kikuyu, who taught him to throw a spear, love wildlife, and carefully observe his surroundings. At Cambridge, where Lewis picked up degrees in anthropology and archaeology, he was in every way a contrarian, and one who wasn't afraid to ruffle feathers. When he proclaimed that he planned to search for early human remains in East Africa, his professors scoffed. But as a boy in Kenya, he had discovered stone arrowheads and tools in the dirt, and from my reading, I knew that they had to be prehistoric tools. Yet most prehistorians dismissed East Africa as a potential site of human fossils. At the time, most thought the key to our ancestry lay in Asia, but Lewis wasn't convinced. He and a fellow student raised funds and took a steamship back to East Africa in 1926. One of his many trips there over the years, he found hand axes where experts told him there would be none. Nothing would deter him from proving his theory right. Bold and gregarious, Lewis was known to make grandiose pronouncements about his findings some of which turned out to be wrong, which damaged his standing in the scientific community. Yet he made promising discoveries. In 1948 in Kenya, he reported finding a 20-million-year-old skull he named Proconsul Africanus, the first fossilized ape skull ever found. But the real breakthroughs lay in wait in Tanzania's Olduvai Gorge, which he would later call a fossil hunter's dream. Lewis was accompanied on his African expeditions by his wife, Mary, who made critical archaeological discoveries of her own at Olduvai. It was a wild, remote place, reachable only with an arduous journey. The anthropologists and a team of local staff lived in a camp of canvas tents, sharing the gorge with lions, rhinos, leopards, hyenas, and other Serengeti wildlife. Their days in the field, Lewis explained, consisted of crawling up and down the slopes of the gorge with eyes barely inches from the ground, stopping at the slightest fragment of a fossil bone or stone implement, and delicately investigating the clue with a fine brush or dental pick. All this in heat that sometimes reaches 110 degrees Fahrenheit. He noted that he and Mary spent more time on their hands and knees than on their feet, as children, their sons would come to work at the site, while the family's loyal Dalmatians frolicked among the fossil beds. In the 1930s, Lewis and Mary began finding primitive stone tools, which they named Olduwan after Olduvai Gorge. The tools were clearly old, but it wasn't until the 1950s that a new technique called potassium argon dating determined that they were around a million and a half years old, by far the most ancient tools found up to that time. 
old wand tools were not the hammers, spears, or harpoon points later crafted in the Middle and Late Stone Ages. They were much cruder implements made by chipping a few flakes of a stone with another stone to form a sharpened edge. Nevertheless, to the Leakies, this ability to fashion crude tools is what truly separated humans from apes. Now the hunt was on to find the elusive tool maker who had crafted these artifacts. It was Mary who was struck by Leakey's luck. One day in 1959, she sped into camp in her truck yelling, I've got him, the one we've been looking for. Come quick, I found his teeth. The find was a skull, including the upper jaw and teeth, which Mary painstakingly reconstructed from 400 small fragments. Lewis concluded that the hominin must have made the old Awan tools. He named it Sinjanthropus Boise, claiming that it was the connecting link between the South African near men and true man as we know him. It was later determined to be close enough in form to Australopiths to be reclassified as Australopithecus Boise, then later reclassified as Paranthropus Boise. The hominin came to be nicknamed Nutcracker Man because of its big, flat, molar teeth and powerful jaw. Mary and Lewis called it Zinge, or more affectionately, Dear Boy. The discovery was momentous. Similar fossils had been found in South Africa, but there was no easy way to determine the age of fossils found in South Africa's limestone caves. In contrast, Olduvai Gorge's fossils were found in deposits sandwiched between layers of volcanic ash which could be precisely dated using the new potassium-argon method. Dating the ash layer above where Zinge was found revealed that the skull was 1.75 million years old, far older than the Neanderthals of Europe or any other hominin outside Africa. More than the fossils themselves, this precise yardstick for dating them trained the search spotlight for early humans squarely on East Africa. With a grant from National Geographic, Lewis, Mary, and their three sons went back to Olduvai in 1960 and worked with a vengeance, putting in more than more hours in 13 months than they had in the previous 30 years combined. They made a few fragmentary finds. Then their 19-year-old son Jonathan discovered a jawbone that made all the toil well worth it. As additional pieces of the skull were unearthed, it was clear they had found something much more human-like than Zinjanthropus, with a bigger brain, smaller face, and no gorilla-like crest on the top of the skull. All in all, it was a much better candidate for the maker of the primitive Olduwan tools previously found in the Olduvai Gorge. The fossil, nicknamed Johnny's Child, had been pulled from sediments presumed to be even older than Zinjanthropus. Lewis and his team were convinced it was an ancient species of Homo. They called their find Homo habilis, or handyman, because they suspected it to be the first true toolmaker. There he is, right? Oh no, this is the parent. This is the dear boy. <laughs> this is it. Its somewhat larger brain and the thousands of stone tools they had found at Olduvai made that seem like a perfectly plausible notion. Theories on prehistory and early man constantly change as new evidence comes to light, Leakey wrote in 1965. A single find, such as Homo habilis, can upset long-held and reluctantly discarded concepts. Upset people, it certainly did. When Lewis Leakey and his team published a paper in Nature in 1964 called A New Species of the Genus Homo from Olduvai Gorge, Maintaining that the find was the first member of the human genus and the first true toolmaker, it generated heated debate. Letters flew to newspapers and journals from Lewis's colleagues, arguing that H. Habilis was just an Australopithecine, not an early species of Homo. At the time, there was a loose agreement that to be called Homo, a fossil must cross the cerebral rubicon, it's hard to say, and have a minimum brain capacity of 750 cubic centimeters. The brain volume of Johnny's child fell well short. In naming it the new Homo species, Lewis was tinkering with the definition of the genus Homo. Controversies aside, Lewis's insights and indefatigable energy contributed hugely to the field. Later, his son Richard would make sensational discoveries of his own at the site of Kubifora in Kenya's Lake Turkana, including another magnificent skull often described as a chabalus, 
and a stunning skeleton of a juvenile member of a later species called Homo erectus. Many scientists view H. habilis as the direct ancestor of H. erectus, which in turn was the direct ancestor of Homo sapiens. But such a simple linear relationship has been called into question as more evidence has accumulated. Finds made in 2000 of a 1.44 million-year-old Homo habilis and a 1.55 million-year-old Homo erectus, both from northern Kenya, suggest that rather than one having descended from the other, the two species may have coexisted in East Africa for hundreds of thousands of years. Further discoveries will be needed to resolve this question, but whatever the future holds, our understanding of our origins will be forever indebted to the Leakey's efforts in the past. Chapter 4. The Curious Case of Dimenisi 1.8 to 1.7 million years ago in Dimenisi, Georgia, with Homo erectus. A trove of fossils found in the Caucasus represents the earliest known ancestors outside Africa. In the shadow of a medieval castle, Paleoanthropologist David Lorkipanitsa Lur and his team hit the jackpot as he described it. The spotlight for human origins research has long been trained on East Africa, home to famous fossils like Lucy and the rich load of evidence from Tanzania's old Uvai Gorge. Lord Kipanitsa's lucky strike was thousands of miles away, in his home country of Georgia, where Europe ends and Asia begins. The small town of Dimenisi in the Caucasus has long been a crossroads for travelers along the fabled Silk Road. In 1991, Lord Kipinitsa and his team began discovering remains of far older wayfarers, the earliest hominins yet known to leave Africa and venture into the rest of the world. Almost two million years ago, before hominins inhabited Dimenisi, a series of volcanic eruptions flooded the site with lava, which hardened into basalt. Later, more eruptions dumped tons of ash on top of the rock. In between those catastrophic rains of ash, life crept back onto the plateau, including hominins. Buried by later ash falls, their remains lay entombed until the 1990s, when archaeologists began finding very old bones beneath the crumbling cellars of medieval ruins. Funded by a National Geographic grant, Lord Kipanitsa and his colleagues made an initial find of a jawbone, merely a taste of what was to come. In the decade that followed, the team unearthed several crania and mandibles. All appeared to be early members of the species Homo erectus. This wasn't surprising in itself. Specimens of H. erectus, including the famous early finds of Java Man and Peking Man, had turned up in both Africa and Eurasia. What was surprising about the find at Dimenisi was that the sediments were between 1.8 and 1.7 million years old, at least 200,000 years older than any other H. erectus in Eurasia, and nearly as old as the oldest in Africa. It had long been thought that what enabled H. erectus to leave Africa for the harsher environment of Eurasia was the invention of a new stone toolkit, including distinctive two-sided hand axes. But the only tools found at Dimenisi were cruder implements similar to ones associated with more primitive hominins in East Africa. So it seemed our ancestors started exploring the world much earlier than we thought, and for reasons that remain a mystery. In 2000, while visiting another dig in western Georgia, Lord Kipanitsa got a call from Dimenisi. Another skull was coming out of the earth. He rushed back and the skull he saw half-buried in the dirt astonished him. Usually fossil skulls are crushed almost beyond recognition, but this one looked almost as complete as one you'd find at a modern crime scene. Most of the fragile bones of its face were intact. The jaw bones had many of their teeth, including prominent canines. The brain case was tiny, less than two-thirds the size of an average Homo erectus, again challenging the notion that greater intelligence played a role in the first migration out of Africa. Lord Kipanitsa also considered the, fa the face of the new skull to be more similar to Homo habilis, the more primitive hominin believed to be the maker of those cruder stone tools in East Africa. There it is. The implications of the find were profound. 
scientists had long thought that the more sophisticated hand axes typically associated with H. erectus allowed them to effectively butcher and process meat, enabling them to take in more energy-rich fat, which in turn could supply nourishment for bigger brains and taller bodies. But the simple scrapers and choppers found at Dimenisi were more suited to a scavenging lifestyle. The average height for a male of this species was only some four feet. Toothwear patterns suggested an omnivorous diet, and the sites where the teeth were found show no evidence of cooking fires, as had been found in some later H. erectus sites. In spite of these apparent disadvantages, the Dimenisi people were able to survive in a climate offering challenges not found in Africa, including potentially severe winters and dangerous predators like hyenas the size of lions. How? One possible clue in the finds was the inclusion of an older, toothless individual, suggesting that a man had survived into old age because others helped him, perhaps a very early sign of compassion in one of our ancestors, though such thinking is difficult to confirm. What we are doing is like reconstructing a crime scene, Lord Kipenitsa said. The crime was long ago, and you can't find witnesses. As if to prove himself wrong, in 2005, Lord Kipenitsa found another spectacular Dimenisi witness. It was discovered on August 5th, he said, in fact, on my birthday. Skull 5, as it's called, is what paleoanthropologists often refer to as a mosaic, or mixture of features seen in earlier and later humans. The skull's face, large teeth, and small brain size resemble those of earlier fossil hominins but the detailed anatomy of its brain case is similar to Homo erectus. This combination of features, along with the primitive traits of the fossils found previously, has fueled a long-running discussion over whether the Dimenisi humans really are H. erectus at all. Some researchers prefer to call them a new species, Homo georgicus. With the discovery of Skull 5, Lord Kipenitsa himself maintained that all the various early Homo species, including Habilis, are members of H. erectus. We think that many African fossils can be lumped in this category and aligned with a single lineage hypothesis, he said. This theory remains very controversial. Most scientists believe that the amount of variation seen in fossils spanning hundreds of thousands of years and great geographical distance is too much for one species name to embrace. But whatever one calls them, the Dimenisi humans and the many contradictions they embody are a puzzle to be reckoned with. Chapter 5. Homo naledi defies definition. This is 335,000 to 236,000 years ago at Rising Star Cave, South Africa. This is Homo naledi. An accidental find deep in a South African cave yields remarkably complete skeletons a baffling mix of primitive and modern features. A stunning trove of hominin remains, the single richest fossil site of its kind ever uncovered in Africa, was found by happenstance deep in a cave. It was arguably the greatest fossil discovery in South Africa in the past half century, and adds a bewildering new twist to our understanding of human evolution. In 2013, a pair of recreational cavers entered a cave called Rising Star, some 30 miles northwest of Johannesburg. Rising Star is a popular draw for cavers, and its filigree of channels and caverns is well mapped. Stephen Tucker and Rick Hunter were hoping to find some less trodden passages, but in the back of their minds was another mission. In the first half of the 20th century, this region of South Africa produced so many fossils of our early ancestors that it later became known as the Cradle of Humankind. Though the heyday of fossil hunting there was long past, the cavers knew that a scientist in Johannesburg was looking for bones. Lee Berger, the American paleoanthropologist who had asked cavers to keep an eye out for fossils, had taken a position at South Africa's University of the Witwatersrand in the 1990s. In the first half of the 20th century, major finds had emerged from nearby limestone caves, including the 1924 in 1924, the Tongue Child, the first Australopithecus species ever discovered. By the time Berger arrived, however, the spotlight in human evolution had long been shifted to the Great Rift Valley of East Africa. Most researchers regarded South Africa as an interesting sidebar to the story of human evolution, but not the main plot. 
What Berger most wanted to find were fossils that could shed light on the most perplexing mystery in human evolution, the origin of our genus Homo. On the far side of that event are the ape-like australopiths, epitomized by Australopithecus afarensis, and its most famous representative, Lucy, a skeleton discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. On the near side is Homo erectus, a tool-wielding, fire-making, globe-trotting species with a big brain and body proportions much like ours. Within a murky million-year gap, a bipedal animal was transformed into a nascent human being. How did that evolution happen? In 2008, while searching in a place later called Malapa, some ten miles from Rising Star Cave, Berger and his son Matthew found some hominin fossils poking out of hunks of dolomite. Over the next year, his team painstakingly chipped two nearly complete skeletons out of the rock. Dated to about two million years ago, they were the first major finds from South Africa published in decades. Berger realized the skeletons were a new species of australopiths, which he named Australopithecus sediba. He believed its features suggested it was a candidate for the ancestor of the first species of our genus. Though the doyens of paleoanthropology credited him with a jaw-dropping find, most dismissed Berger's interpretation of it as ancestral to Homo. But a Homo jaw more than half a million years older had already been found in Ethiopia. A sediba was too young, too weird, and not in the right place. It wasn't one of us. Berger shook off the rejection and got back to work. Then one night, Pedro Boshoff, a caver and geologist, geologist Berger had hired to look for fossils, knocked on his door. With him was Stephen Tucker. Tucker explained how he and Rick Hunter had found a narrow, vertical chute in the Rising Star Cave, in some places less than eight inches wide. Ugh, claustrophobia. A passageway led into a larger cavity, its walls and ceiling covered with gnarls of calcite and jutting flowstone fingers. But what was on the floor drew the two men's attention. There were bones everywhere. They weren't stone-heavy like most fossils, nor were they encased in stone. They were just lying there, as if someone had tossed them in. They noticed a piece of a lower jaw with teeth intact. Even to their inexpert eyes, it looked human. Berger could see from the photos that the bones were indeed human, but they did not belong to a modern human being. Certain features, especially those of the jawbone and teeth, were far too primitive. But what was it? How old were the bones? And how did they get into that cave? Tucker and Hunter lacked the skills needed to excavate the fossils, and no scientist Berger knew, certainly not himself, had the physique to squeeze through the na that narrow chute. He put the word out on Facebook. Skinny individuals wanted, with scientific credentials and caving experience, must be willing to work in cramped quarters. Within a week and a half, he'd heard from nearly 60 applicants. He chose the six most qualified. All were young women. Berger called the crew the underground astronauts. With funding from the National Geographic Society, he gathered some 60 scientists and set up an above-ground command center, a science tent, and a small village of sleeping and support tents. Local cavers helped thread two miles of communication and power cables down into the fossil chamber. Marina Elliott, then a graduate student at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, was the first scientist down the chute. Looking down into it, I wasn't sure I'd be okay, Elliot said later. It was like looking into a shark's mouth. There were fingers and tongues and teeth of rock. Working in two-hour shifts with a three-woman crew, Elliot's team plotted and bagged more than 400 fossils on the surface, then started carefully removing soil around a half-buried skull. Over the next several days, the other scientists huddled around the video feed in the command center above in a state of near-constant excitement. During November 2013 and March 2014, they found some 1,550 specimens, representing at least 15 individuals, the largest collection of a single hominin species ever found in Africa. Skulls, jaws, ribs, dozens of teeth, a nearly complete foot, a hand, virtually every bone intact, arranged as if in life. A second chamber had been located with additional bones, we found a most remarkable creature, Berger said. Parts of the skeletons looked astonishingly modern, but other parts were just as remarkably primitive. 
The hand looked fully modern except for its wackedly curved fingers, fit for a creature climbing trees. The shoulders were apish too, and the widely flaring blades of the pelvis were as primitive as Lucy's. The lower half of the pelvis, however, looked like a modern human's. The leg bones started out shaped like an astrolopith's, but seemed to gather modernity as they descended toward the ground. The feet were virtually indistinguishable from our own. Berger and his team named the species Homo naledi, after the Sesotho word for star. It was a curious anomaly that posed a lot of questions. Most important, how old was it? Dating finds in South Africa's limestone caves has always been a challenge, and H. Naledi was no different. It took two more years to complete analyses of the age of the rocks surrounding the fossils. The fossils turned out to be between 335,000 and 236,000 years old, far younger than anyone had expected given their primitive features. That age implied that while our own species Homo sapiens was evolving from other large-brained ancestors, a little-brained shadow lineage was lingering on from a much earlier period. How can one explain how two kinds of human, alike in some ways, very different in others, could coexist for so long a period? The conventional metaphor for an evolutionary lineage is a tree branching from a single root. Berger himself thinks that a better metaphor is a braided stream, a river that divides into channels only to merge again downstream. Similarly, the various hominin types that inhabited the landscapes of Africa, including H. Naledi, must at some point have diverged from a common ancestor. But then farther down the river of time, they may have coalesced again, so that we at the river's mouth, carrying us today a bit of East Africa, a bit of South Africa, and a whole lot of prehistory we have yet to discover. Chapter 6. The Ancestor in a Test Tube. This is 200,000 to 50,000 years ago, the Altai Mountains in Siberia, it's the Denisovans. A cave in Russia added a mysterious member to the human family, the first fossil hominin identified as a new species based on its DNA alone. There is a cave, nestled under a rock face in the Altai Mountains of southern Siberia, that has long been a draw to wayfaring humans. Neolithic hunters camped there, and later Turkish pastoralists found welcome shelter, gathering their herds around them to ride out the Siberian winters. It is said that a hermit, Denis, made the cave his home in the 18th century, and so it came to be called Denisova, but beneath the years of accumulated sheep dung lie paleontological treasures that are much, much older. In the back of the cave, in a small side chamber, a young Russian archaeologist named Alexander Zabankov was digging one day in July 2008, in deposits believed to be 30,000 to 50,000 years old. He came upon a tiny piece of bone. It was hardly promising, a rough nubbin about the size and shape of a pebble you might shake out of your shoe. Later, the paleoanthropologist charged with identifying the bone called it the most unspectacular fossil I've ever seen. It's practically depressing. Still, it preserved just enough anatomy for him to recognize it as a chip from a primitive, from a primate fingertip, specifically the part that faces the last joint in the pinky. There it is. Because there's no evidence for primates other than humans, no apes or monkeys in Siberia 30,000 to 50,000 years ago, the fossil was presumably from some kind of human. Anatoly Dervyanko, leader of the Altai excavations and director of the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography in Novosibirsk, had an idea. Bones from a nearby site had yielded enough trace of genetic material to identify them as Neanderthals. Was this also from a Neanderthal, or could it be a modern human? Artifacts from Denisova, including a gorgeous bracelet of green stone, had clearly been made by humans like us. Dervyanko sent the bone chip to Svante Pabo, an evolutionary geneticist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany, and arguably the world's leading expert in ancient DNA. There, the case of the Denisovan pinky bone took a startling turn. Johannes Krauss, at the time a senior member of Pabo's team, and his student extracted the finger bone's mitochondrial DNA, or the mtDNA. 
a small bit of the genome that exists in hundreds of copies in living cells and is therefore easier to find in ancient bone. They compare the DNA sequence with those of living humans and with Neanderthals. Then they repeated the analysis because they couldn't believe the results they'd gotten the first time around. Then Kraus called his boss. Johannes asked me if I was sitting down, Papa remembered of their phone call. I said I wasn't, and he replied that I'd better find a chair. The tiny chip of a finger bone was not from a Neanderthal, nor was it from a modern human. Based on its DNA, it belonged to a whole new kind of human, never before seen. Da, da, da. <laughs> the evidence was strong. DNA degrades over time, so usually very little remains in a bone tens of thousands of years old. Moreover, the DNA from the bone itself, called endogenous DNA, endogenous? That's my cat snoring. <laughs> Let me wake him up real quick. Kitty. Kitty cat. Hello. Love you. It's a good boy. He is passed out, man. He's not waking up. <laughs> anyway. And let's go for endogenous DNA is typically just a tiny fraction of the total DNA in a specimen, most of which comes from soil bacteria and other contaminants. None of the Neanderthal fossils that Pablo and his colleagues had ever tested contained even 5% endogenous DNA, and most had less than 1%. To their amazement, the DNA in the finger bone, which they identified as belonging to a young girl, was some 70% endogenous. Not Neanderthal, not modern human, but a new population the team called the Denisovans. It was the first fossil hominin identified through its DNA alone. In the years to come, a human toe bone emerged at Denisova, as well as some enormous teeth. The DNA from the teeth showed they too were Denisovan, but to everyone's shock, the toe bone turned out to be a Neanderthal. Along with the stone bracelet and other modern human artifacts, this meant that three kinds of humans had occupied that one magical cave, perhaps overlapping in time. In 2010, scientists had sequenced the full Denisovan genome. It showed that though they were more closely related to the Neanderthals, they had also left their mark on living humans, but the geographic pattern of that legacy was odd. When the researchers compared the Denisovan genome with those of various modern human populations, they found no trace of it in Russia or nearby China. Surprisingly, Denisovan DNA turned up in the genomes of New Guineans, other people from islands in Melanesia, and Australian Aborigines. Putting all the data together, Pabo and his colleagues proposed a scenario to explain what might have occurred. In Africa, sometime before 500,000 years ago, the ancestors of modern humans split off from the lineage that would give rise to Neanderthals and Denisovans. While our ancestors stayed in Africa, the common ancestor of Neanderthals and Denisovans migrated out. Those two lineages later diverged, with the Neanderthals initially moving west into Europe and the Denisovans spreading east, perhaps eventually populating large parts of the Asian continent. Hold on, he's snoring again. Hi. You're snoring too loud. Keep it down, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Okay. I will come up. <laughs> Where were we? Later still, when modern humans ventured out of Africa themselves, they encountered Neanderthals in the Middle East and Central Asia, and to a limited extent interbred with them. Modern humans venturing farther into Asia bred with Denisovans as well, accounting for the traces of their DNA in living Southeast Asian people. Later discoveries have added new twists to the story. In 2018, Vivian Sloan and Pabo did a genome analysis on a 90,000-year-old hominin bone fragment from Denisova Cave and found that it had a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovan father, providing the first proof of an ancient human hybrid, which added to the mounting evidence that ancient species cohabited at Denisova. In 2019, Chinese researchers announced the discovery of a Denisovan jawbone found in the Tibetan Plateau, the first of its kind found outside the Siberian cave. The discovery confirmed that the Denisovans were more widespread. 
That same year, DNA from a large sampling of living Southeast Asians suggested that the Denisovans may not have been a single population, but three distinct ones. One group may have outlasted even the Neanderthals, who disappeared some 40,000 years ago. According to the study, these Denisovans coexisted and mixed with modern humans in New Guinea until at least 30,000 years ago, and perhaps as recently as 15,000 years ago. If confirmed, that date would mean the Denisovans were the last known humans other than ourselves to walk the earth. Chapter 7. The Tiny People Time Forgot. This is 100,000 to 50,000 years ago in Flores, Indonesia. It's Homo Florensians. Miniature beings sprang from an ancient line of human ancestors in a remote island location where no one expected them to be. Open ocean has long separated the islands of Indonesia from mainland Asia. Scientists had assumed that none of our ancient relatives could have reached the islands without the ability to build boats. But life finds a way. In 2003, when a joint Indonesia-New Zealand team led by archaeologist Mike Moorwood unearthed a little skeleton in a spacious cave on the Indonesian island of Flores, they thought at first it was a child, perhaps three years old but a closer look showed that the tiny, fragile bones belonged to a fully grown adult just over three feet tall. Was it a modern human stunted by disease or malnutrition? Apparently not. The bones looked too primitive, and the remains of at least four similarly sized individuals from Lengbois, which means cool cave in the local Mangorai language, confirmed that the skeleton was not a unique, deformed individual. Instead, it was a it was typical of a whole population of tiny beings who once lived on this remote island. Moorwood's team had discovered a new, remarkable kind of human, long isolated by time and space. The full dimensions of what they had discovered began to emerge upon analysis. Incredibly, this tiny human relative, which they nicknamed the Hobbit, could have been around as recently as 18,000 years ago, at least according to original dating of the fossil. This was long after modern humans had begun their march around the globe. Yet in some ways, the Hobbit looked like a diminutive version of human ancestors from Africa a hundred times older. The team appeared to have stumbled upon pygmy survivors from an earlier era, hanging on far from the main currents of human prehistory. Who were they? How did they reach and survive on a remote Indonesian island that was never connected by a land bridge to either Asia or Australia? What could this lost relative have to tell us about our evolutionary past? The first far-flung human species, Homo erectus, crossed land bridges from Asia to Indonesia, but their trail seemed to end at Java, the site of Homo erectus bones some 1.5 million years old. No one believed these early humans could cross the ocean barrier, called the Wallace Line. Scientists thought it wasn't until 50,000 years ago that people, modern Homo sapiens, made that leap. In the 1950s and 60s, priest and part-time archaeologist Theodor Verhoeven had found ancient stone tools in the Soa Basin in Flores, perhaps a sign that Homo erectus crossed the Wallace Line much earlier than previously thought. But no one took this amateur archaeologist's claims very seriously. It wasn't until the 1990s that other researchers used advanced techniques to confirm the Soa Basin's tools were indeed 840,000 years old. Still, no actual remains of Flores' earlier inhabitants had shown up. The skeleton's pelvic structure told scientists that the hobbit, given the species name Homo floresiensis, Flor was a female and her tooth wear confirmed that she was an adult. Her sloping forehead and prominently arched brow ridges resembled the anatomy of Homo erectus, but she was only half as tall as a modern human. With an estimated weight of about 55 pounds, then there was her startlingly small brain. Peter Brown, the paleoanthropologist in Australia who first examined the hobbit, calculated its volume at less than a third of the modern humans. Her brain was among the smallest of any member of the genus Homo. That, along with her startlingly young age and other strange primitive traits, sparked debates about where she fit within the human family tree. 
Most experts now think she probably evolved from an earlier Homo erectus population, perhaps the makers of the tools Verhoeven found. Her ancestors may have stood several feet taller at first, but over hundreds of thousands of years of isolation on Flores they dwindled in size. Biogeographer Mark Limolino, Lomolino, who studies the phenomenon called island dwarfism, said such a reduction in size is fairly common. We know that when evolutionary pressures change, some species respond by shrinking. It's a common fate among large mammals marooned on islands, because having fewer predators makes size and strength less important adaptations. The discovery underscored a puzzle going back to Theodore Verhoeven. How could ancient hominins ever have reached Flores? Was Homo erectus a better mariner than anyone suspected, able to build rafts and plan voyages? How they managed to get there, said Morewood at the time, is still a real mystery. And it raised a new and haunting question. Modern humans colonized Australia from mainland Asia about 50,000 years ago, populating Indonesia on their way. Did they and the hobbits ever meet? In 2016, a new study called into question the original date range for Homo floresiensis. Their analysis of the sediments at Langbua revealed that these humans had lived between 100,000 and 60,000 years ago. Tools found in the same deposits were dated from 190,000 to 50,000 years. Another study that year found stone tools on the neighboring island of Sulawesi that also predate the arrival of modern humans. They were likely made by Homo erectus, but it's also possible that the tool makers are yet undiscovered relatives of Homo floresiensis or members of that group who had migrated to a more hospitable place. What happened to the hobbits? Did they ever encounter modern humans? In 2019, a study of rat bones found in Longbois added new clues to H. Florensiensis' fate. Measuring more than 12,000 rat bones and grouping them by size, they discovered that medium-sized rats that prefer more open habitats dominated the site until about 60,000 years ago, when the bones gave way to smaller, more forest-adapted rats, suggesting a marked environmental change. Previously, scientists hypothesized that all the large fauna on Flores went extinct. The signal from the rats, however, suggests H. floresiensis's departure from Longbois may simply be because they, along with other large animals, left in search of more open environments. And study leader Elizabeth Veach, said study leader Elizabeth Veach, the results could mean that the hobbit species lingered on into the more recent past and may have even come into contact with our most immediate ancient ancestors. Resolving such puzzles will require additional discoveries. Chapter 8. New Light on Neanderthals 45,000 to 35,000 years ago in Iraqi Kurdistan, Homo Neanderthalensis Remains in Shanidar Cave in Iraq show us that Neanderthal life was hard, but they helped one another through it. Neanderthals have captured our imagination since the first traces of their existence tumbled out of a lime quarry in Germany in 1856. Early investigators regarded their behavior as more apish than human, and their lives, to echo Thomas Hobbes, as nasty, brutish, and short. But a discovery in Iraq some 100 years later proved that, in some critical ways, the Neanderthals were much more like us than their low foreheads and glowering brow ridges would suggest. In the 1950s, Smithsonian anthropologist Ralph Selecki, together with Kurdish workers and a team from Columbia University, unearthed the fossilized bones of eight adult and two infant Neanderthal skeletons at a site called Shanidar Cave in the Kurdistan area of northern Iraq. Many other Neanderthal remains had been found before in Europe, but this was one of the largest samples, and it changed our perception of the species more than any previous discovery. Paleontologist Eric Trinkaus spent the late 1970s studying the remains. What he found suggested that life for these ancients was far from easy. The practice of hunting big animals in their prime is rarely seen among hominins before the Neanderthals, and the Shanidar remains made it clear that big game meat came at a price. One male, called Shanidar I, had suffered crushing wounds to his right leg, ankle, and foot, a blow to his skull that probably blinded him in one eye and left him deaf, 
and a shattered right arm which was severed above the elbow. The rib of another individual was notched, possibly by a stab wound. Painful arthritis visible on the ankle bones plagued several other Shanadar cave dwellers. So many Neanderthal bones across their range showed traumatic breaks that one of Trinkhouse's graduate students, Tommy Berger, decided to investigate their patterns. He analyzed the bones of 17 Neanderthals who had suffered a total of 27 traumatic injuries. I noticed that they were mostly injuries to the head and upper body, almost no lower limb injuries, Berger said. He compared the injuries to those suffered by a variety of active modern humans, such as firefighters. The closest match? Rodeo riders. Neanderthal life was clearly very hard and very dangerous, said Trinkhouse. They were tough survivors. And, he said, their bodies were built for just such a bruising lifestyle. These guys would have made Schwarzenegger look like a wimp, Trinkhouse said. If I had muscles like that, all I'd have to do is flex my pecs and I'd break my ribs. Their bones tell us they had a lot of strength and endurance. That must be what their lives demanded of them. Their battered bones told stories of woe, but also of compassion. Four out of the six adult Neanderthal skeletons found in the Shanadar cave were deformed by disease and injuries, but all the injuries show signs of healing. Another specimen called Shanadar III, one of the only specimens that lived into his forties, seemed as if something had punched between his ribs and stayed there probably died eventually of infection following a punctured lung, Trinkow said, but he lived for a while. Someone must have taken care of him. Ooh, that's a cool looking cave. The fact that the battered Shanadar individual survived past the average age of 30 and with partially healed injuries showed they were not left to die, and suggests others in the community fed, protected, and helped them a sign of empathy and cooperation not seen in earlier hominin species. The placement of their bodies intimated another sign of care, and a milestone in prehistory, ritual burying of the dead. Flower pollen was found with one of the skeletons. It seemed unlikely that flowers would have grown at that site, or that animals or the wind had carried in the pollen. So how did it get there? Selecki and his wife, anthropologist Rose L. Selecki, theorized that the Shanidar cave doubled as a cemetery plot, where the dead were laid to rest with an arrangement of flowers. Some person or persons once ranged the mountainside, collecting these flowers one by one, he wrote in Science Magazine in 1975. The idea was strengthened, he thought, by the types of flower pollen found with the bones, daisy and yarrow, both long considered healing herbs perhaps placed there for their therapeutic properties. It was a romantic idea that captured the public imagination, but not everyone agrees about the flower burials. Some scientists think the pollen may indeed have been brought in by animals. In February 2020, however, researchers found a new skeleton at Shanidar, the first articulated Neanderthal skeleton to come out of the ground in more than 20 years. It was found quite near the flower burial site, and there's strong evidence that the discovery, called Shanidar Z, was also deliberately buried. Perhaps there's truth in the romance. That's the end for tonight. Look what's coming up next. Good old Stone Age. So we'll continue this at a later date. Thank you so much for watching the blank hardcover. Let me get this back out. This is a lot cooler to look at. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope you have a very 